I'm sorry? No, I, I didn't understand. So we are going live now, sir. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Spotlight lecture series presented by MTX Incorporated has been bringing the best speakers around the world in front of you. Keeping up with the motivation to inspire, excite the Shastra community, on Tata Projects Limited Day 3 of Shastra 22, we have with us one of the most prominent speakers in our lineup this year, Dr. David J. Weinlin, a Nobel laureate physicist, well known for making groundbreaking discoveries in the field of quantum physics. Dr. David J. Weinlin is the Philip H. Knight Distinguished Research Chair at the University of Oregon and also holds a research associate position at NIST and an adjoint professor position at the University of Colorado. Having graduated from prestigious universities such as Harvard and UC Berkeley, he went on to design ingenious experiments which would study quantum phenomena. His work has greatly advanced the field of optics, specifically his research on laser cooling trapped ions and using ions for quantum computing operations. At NIST, his group demonstrated the first deterministic multi-qubit logic gates using individual quantum systems. In 2005, Dr. Weinland implemented the most precise atomic clock using quantum logic on a single aluminum ion. He shared the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for the manipulation and measurement of individual quantum systems. We will now have a lecture from Professor Weinland on the topic of atomic clocks. You know, the, the, pic, the pictures of us are blocking out my screen so I can't see it. Uh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. I'm, I think I'm finally ready here. So I should go ahead. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry to be a little late here. I was having some uh, internet problems. So anyway, um, as you can see, I'm gonna be talking a bit about atomic clocks. And uh, just to summarize briefly, what I'll cover is, uh, I, I'll ask why we, you know, why we want precise clocks. And, uh, and I'll give a little bit of idea of the basic ideas of, of atomic clocks. I think you'll, if I do it right, you should be able to build your own atomic clock after this lecture. But, um, so I'm gonna, and I'll, I'll talk, about, I'll, I'll, these days what's become important more recently is that atomic clocks that tick at optical frequencies. And now I'll say why, why that's interesting and, and how we do that. Um, and I'm going to use, uh, I spent most of my career uh, at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so I'm going to use examples from there. I'm still affiliated with the lab there. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, examples using atomic ions, charged atoms, but uh, the neutral atoms are also very good, good as well. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about them at, towards the end of the talk. And then at the end, I'll conclude, give a little idea of where, where, where we are right now and what the future might hold. So why do we want precise clocks? Well, one of the reasons is it's been true for centuries uh, that, that they've been used in navigation. And just to give you an idea, I'm not a sailor, but so anybody who's a sailor in the audience, you could under, figure that you, you know what I'm gonna talk about. But basically um, before things like GPS and so on, the, the people on the, surface of the earth, if they had a sextant, they could say for the Northern hemisphere, uh, you know, have a direction that they look to find the Northern, the North star. And, uh, and then if they measured the angle relative to the, the of their level uh, ground where they are, 
and the and the di the direction to the north star. This angle would uniquely determine uh, where they are in terms of latitude, in terms of latitude, that is north south directions. So that's pretty straightforward. And the idea is for, for longitude, the east-west direction is essentially the same, but we need time. And the reason for that is just because the earth is rotating. And so we knew what, need to know what time it is to be able to take the angle we measure with our sextant to, uh, to tell where we are in terms of, of longitude. And just to give you an idea of the, the, you know, the errors that are involved here, so if we, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to work through this little simple calculation, but the, so if we have, a, if, if we have, if we want a certain precision in the, in the, in the uh, longitude position, uh, we can, we can easily find that if we had a clock that's good to about one second, that would give us a precision of about a quarter of a nautical mile. And there's some interesting history to this in the, in the, Early 1700s, the the British had just had suffered a, several uh, naval disasters where the ships crashed on the rocks and so on, because they just didn't they didn't have good enough time to tell where they were in terms of of longitude. So actually, in in the early 1700s, the British Parliament sponsored what they called the Longitude Act, and there was a uh, you know they would give a prize of twenty thousand dollars, which was a huge amount of money then, if someone could come up with a way to to uh, navigate within 30 uh, nautical miles. And if we use this expression up here, that's just being able to, we would need to know time to two minutes, basically. And there's a nice book, if you, you know, that isn't very technical, it's, it's, it's worth reading, like, giving the history. I mean, one of the interesting thing, they came up with this prize and then <laughs> the, with the person that won it, his name is a, a British clockmaker, his name is John Harrison. And, uh, it took him many years to, to collect, collect the prize, and finally the king had to step in and make sure that he got his got his reward, this twenty thousand pounds. Unfortunately, he, did, he died a couple of years later, so really must have been awful hectic for him. Okay, so but now I think most of you know we nowadays we we, we navigate but via satellites, and the idea there is this pretty simple, uh, and that is say to to, to, to determine the distance between you on the earth and set one of the satellites. Yeah. Uh, if we agree on some protocol, it's more complicated than one I'm saying here, but let's say we had a protocol where if, if the clocks are synchronized, that is they tick exactly at the same rate, then uh, we, we, the, by some protocol, we'd have the satellite emit a pulse of radiation. And then because of the finite speed of light, it would take a certain amount of time to reach us on the, on the, on the Earth. So the distance from us to the, the satellite would be just given by the, uh, the difference in the time of arrival versus the time the pulse was emitted times the speed of light. And so, uh, you know, a simple calculation tells, tells us here that if we could hold the, the, the oh, sorry about that, if we could hold the precision of the clock uh, to about a nanosecond, uh, we can actually uh, navigate to 30, 30 centimeters, at least in terms of this distance. And this is about, I, I, I don't know where the exact state of the art, but the, but the, the best the best systems right now are on the order of 30 centimeters. Anyway, this also, so what that corresponds to is that we need time at a precision that if we take one nanosecond over one day, that's a part in 10 to the 14. And that's also the, the you know, the required, precision, that, that is how constant the clock rate has to be over the, say, the period of, of a day, about a part in 10 to the 14. So, of course, it's a little more complicated than that, and, and the GPS, for example, has a network of satellites. I only show four here, but the idea is there's, there's enough satellites within view, uh, and the system is, is you know, is basically overdetermined, but the, I, the satellites comparing their positions with each other and with, with us on the ground, uh, that we can get uh, you know the distance from ourselves to each one of these satellites, and we can also actually we can you know hone in and get the uh, make sure our time is everything synchronized. So that that's uh, that's about how that works. And so what about what about clocks now? And uh, uh, basically, I think it, you know that we we. We don't, as physicists, I think for the most part, we don't think a difference about 
uh, you know, clocks than the person that it's not a physicist. And so basically the idea is we have some periodic event generator. And, and if we count cycles of this oscillation, then we can generate time. That's, that's, that's basically it. And uh, of course the, tra the traditional periodic event generators of frequency references are of course the, the rotation of the earth. And actually in the, you know, in, until the, until the 20th century, the pendulum clocks were actually very good. You know, the high precision pendulum clocks were very good. So they, they were good timekeeping pieces. Uh, so now if we think about atoms, uh, I mean, physicists like to talk about wave functions and things like that. But uh, basically the idea that in the quantum picture, we have the electron, it's not, it's not localized like we think about in the classical picture. It's kind of smeared out, but the, but the idea of, you know, this classical idea is, is just, it's, it would be the same uh, for whether it's quantum or not. And, the, uh, and, and in the quantum picture, this oscillating electron density, it's, it's an electric dipole, so it will radiate. And in fact, uh, if the, the, the radiation frequency is determined by uh, the, the difference in energy, two energy levels of the atom divided by Planck's constant. Uh, so, uh, and, and so the, some of the early clocks were based on masers or lasers. And I think that, I think uh, most everybody knows what a laser is, light, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. But actually the first clocks based on the laser principle were actually called masers because M stands for microwave and L stands for light, of course. So they just ran at this somewhat lower frequency. But the idea then is that the, if, if this, if, if we have a maser or laser, that the picture is we, you know, we usually have our atoms inside of a cavity, a, not, uh, a microwave cavity, for example, and the, that cavity allows us to build up, uh, build up the radiation. We can sample some of that, and then we just count cycles of this radiation uh, to give us time. So this is actually, I, I, I didn't really say, but basically, my whole career has been in. At least not continually, but uh, with clocks. And I actually, so I was a student of Norman Ramsey, and Norman, he's here, uh, and he's he's certainly one of the most famous atomic physicists of the 20th century. And uh, so anyway, he, he when I went to to Harvard as a grad student in 1965, he and his colleague Dan Kleppner had demonstrated a, a maser based on hydrogen, and uh, so that so what but what Norman wanted is he wanted to have precise frequencies of all the hydrogen isotopes. So my my, uh, my the, the big the base the main part of my thesis was to make a, a maser based on deuterium. The principle is just the same as for hydrogen, but the wavelength's quite a bit different. So we had to account for that. But anyway, that's uh, that's how I spent my my uh, uh, graduate school days and. In fact, my, so my, the main result of my thesis was the frequency of this hyperfine transition. By the way, the hyperfine transition is just based on the, again, we have two energy levels and in the, in the, in the, in the hydrogen or deuterium maser, the energy difference comes from just from whether the, the, the electron and, and nuclear spin are opposite or, or they're aligned together. That gives the energy difference. And so that's, this frequency times h bar uh, the energy gives that energy in, in deuterium and this the, the experiment wasn't so much different than the hydrogen so it wasn't a you know a, a standout experiment groundbreaking experiment but it certainly was a good training round so you know it taught me how to make contra precise control of the environment and also we, we we found very very long superposition states that is the atoms would take about a second to radiate their radiate away their energy. And this gave a uh, higher precision because of this long lifetime of the, of the, of the radiation lifetime. So I, I, I show this picture again, and uh, uh, actually the, the, there was one, there's a, there's a little subtle problem with um, the masers or the lasers. And that is that the, as I mentioned before, the atoms are inside of a cavity, but the cavity also has a resonance frequency. And so there, there are ways to, to synchronize the, the cavity frequency to the atomic frequency, but there, I mean, there, it's difficult to do. 
so uh, rather than, uh, it, and we call that frequency pulling, that is if they're not exactly tuned together, then the, the ca ca cavity, its resonance will pull the frequency of the atoms. So that's, that was a problem. So basically with the way we think about doing, uh, making a clock these days is, uh, but we have our atoms and we're just gonna consider two energy levels again. And the idea is that we, we, this more common mode of operation is we initialize the atoms in the, in the lower state, which is giving labels here, one and two in this simple example. And then we apply radiation uh, at some frequency near this resonance frequency of the atom. Uh, and, and, then the, the, and then what we do, oops, sorry about that. And then when we have that condition, then we just measure the probability of, of the atom being excited to this upper energy level. And when this, this transition probability is maximum, that guarantees that the radiation source is exactly equal to the frequency of the, of the atom given by the atom, given by its energy difference, the energy difference of the two energy levels. So yeah, and then so when this condition is met, we just count the cycles of this radiation to generate time. So why atomic clocks? And there's, there's a number of reasons. And what I'm gonna do here is compare to pendulum clocks and, uh, and, and actually the, the same, the similar things I'm gonna say about the pendulum clocks I'll, I'll sort of apply it like the quartz crystal oscillators too, but there's mechanical issues. And so just to give you an idea, so the, the kind of things we have to worry about is you know, what kind of perturb the frequency of the clock. And with a, you know, with a pendulum clock, uh, it, it, it can boil down to something very simple. Like, so this is just the expression for the frequency of, of low amplitude oscillations. And this is the acceleration of gravity and the length of this of the pendulum bob. And th then the frequency is given by this expression here. So one of the problems you have with pendulum clocks is that if the temperature changes, <coughs> pardon me, then uh, usually, you know, most materials that, as the temperature rises, the, the, the length of the material will expand. But even for very low expansion material uh, materials that I show an example here, this is a, that's about a part in 10 to the eight per degree C for the length change of this, of this pendulum. And that's, most metals are about a few hundred times larger than this. So yeah, we need special materials. And actually there's, for example, there's certain kinds of glass that do this very well. Anyway, but if we work that out and, and stick this expression in to a change of frequency, a given change of temperature, it turns out using this expression, it turns out that this, uh, it, it, for expansion material, even this very low expansion material, uh, the frequency shift is about almost a part in 10 to the eighth per degree C. So we all, pardon me, we also have to worry about temperature with our atoms. And, and this is here, this is more interesting to put. So if our, if our atoms are moving, what Einstein talk told us uh, that if uh, when, at, when atoms, two reference frames move relative to each other. So for, for example, the atoms are moving relative to us as their observer in the lab. And it turns out that what Einstein showed is it just isn't uh, that there's an effective temperature and it doesn't, it isn't though the fat atoms are affected and what the profound thing that Einstein told us of course was that that the that at time, the rate of time changes in a moving relative, a, a, a reference frame moving relative to us. Anyway, we you know we can take the expressions that he wrote and uh, for example, uh, I, I, I won't work it out here, but for example, for a mass of 133 mass units, and this would correspond, for example, to cesium, uh, the fractional frequency shift is. Uh, almost about seven orders of magnitude. The sensitivity is about seven orders of magnitude less than it is for this pendulum clock. And as I say, the things like quartz crystals have similar things to worry about. So this is one reason we choose atoms. And the other thing is that, uh, the, of course, in a pendulum clock or a quartz crystal clock, that you know the actual frequency depends on the on 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 manufacturing tolerances. Or in the pendulum clock, for example, the length isn't going to be exactly equal to for all clocks. And of course, the pendulum clock, it depends on the local value of gravity. And if, you know, finally, for example, the, the bearing that holds the pendulum might, might wear and that would tend to lengthen the clock. So there's issues like that. So 
what's nice about atoms is that uh, all atoms of particular species, for example, take cesium-133, are exactly identical. And of course, atoms don't wear out. We can use the same atoms for as long as we can keep them in our apparatus. They, they simply don't wear out. And so anyway, this, this was, of course, appreciated you know, quite a bit uh, before the, the first accurate clocks were realized. But anyway, in, in the 1960s, the, uh, the cesium atom, its hyperfine transition, just the anal analog of, of the hydrogen transition, uh, is about 9 billion in so many cycles. So in 1967, the, the, you know, the people in the international committees decided that they would just define the frequency of cesium. Of course, it was very close to this with the clocks they had, but then they just decided to fix the second based on this exact definition of the hyperfine frequency of, of, uh, of cesium. And in fact, this, this, this uh, I'll, as I'll explain, we have better clocks now, but this example, this, pardon me, this, definition of the second is still true today. So if you look up for the definition of the second, you'll find it's uh, 9 billion and so many oscillations of this cesium atom. So why atomic, uh, optical atomic clocks? And the reason there is that we just, we, of course, optical transitions and the energy difference between the two levels is quite a bit larger. And all that means is that then the tick rate of, of our clock can be much faster. And the reason that's interesting is just, that if we get more ticks per second, we can define the second up in, into finer and finer intervals. Uh, and so that's why we, you know, we, we started these experiments in 1982 in, in Colorado, but, uh, uh, but anyway, it, 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 you know, that was the basic idea. That was the goal to be able to, to capture, to be able to measure these oscillation frequencies and optical transitions. And the other nice thing about it, we, I, 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 we started out with mercury uh, and it, you know, it's, you know, there's there's no ideal atom, but it, but it's a pretty good one. And one of the things about mercury is that the lifetime of the upper level uh, is about uh, is is a, a couple tenths of a second, and that gives a a resolution on the feature of this absorption that we're trying to measure. Uh, you know, it's very pardon me. <laughs> uh, you know, the the fractional uh, change of the signal versus when the the, the laser might move uh, is is you know extremely precise, and so that also gives the precision. So this the line width of this feature is about one and a half hertz. So our optical clock's a new idea, and basically no. And what's curious of there was a fellow at NIST that wrote this this article here, and basically he dug up some old references, and he found a text written by Lord Kelvin and his and his colleague Peter Tate, and they attribute the eye to Maxwell, who's the you know the father of electrodynamic theory. And, uh, but anyway, they, they, they wrote in this text that I say recent discoveries indicate that all natural uh, pieces of matter, such as hydrogen uh, or sodium, uh, you know, they can be readily made in infinite numbers. Well, maybe not infinite, but large numbers. And they're actually alike in every physical property. And so they had, and in fact, they were actually thinking about sodium. The, uh, the, when they talked about oscillations of sodium, they're talking about the optical oscillations of the electrons. And uh, so anyway, th so that they had the, this was the idea for atomic clocks that goes way back well before the hydrogen, uh, the, the, uh, the masers and the cesium clock. Uh, and what's, what's kind of, what's interesting about this is that, I mean, they had the idea that, that, that atoms are all the same and they make the statement here that, that, you know, the modes of vibration are absolutely independent of the position of the universe. Well, they can be excused because they didn't know about Einstein. And I'm, I'll bring this up a little later. It does depend on where you are in the universe. And I'll give you the, uh, what, what, what the issue we have to deal with there. So I, as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about charged atoms. And for our first example was, was mercury ions. And the, the two people that are, are, are uh, credited with de uh, making these ion, we call them traps, but uh, are, Hans Stable from the University of Washington and Wolfgang Powell, who's from Bonn University. And they, they actually, in 1989, they shared the Nobel Prize with, with Norman Ramsey for their developments of the, you know, the precise spectroscopy and these, these methods to measure uh, that transition. Oops, sorry about that. 
so if you know it, the, the basic idea is, I, I, it's not very hard for us to. It takes a while to go through it, but basically the idea is we apply just a combination of static and oscillating electric potentials to these electrodes, and and that's what provides is it creates actually a three dimensional harmonic well and. And, you know, you, you know, a simple picture in 2D is if you had a marble in a bowl, it would roll back and forth in this bowl. And so that would mimic the action of an electron in an atom. So we, uh, you know, we started an experiment in, uh, at NIST in, on this mercury ion. And in fact, my colleague and long-term colleague, uh, Jim Berquist, was the, led this project on the, on the mercury clock. And, you know, we all worked together in the group, but, but he was the leader of this project. And again, I mentioned that the oops, sorry. Uh, this this transition frequency uh, is in the ultraviolet at a wavelength of 282 nanometers, and uh, so that that challenges them to to be able to measure the radi radi the frequency of radiation when it uh, when the atom absorbs the radiation. So. So the, how do we detect, in fact, so one issue we have to tell is how do we detect when this transition happened? And there's a nice picture. This is a common thing that's done a lot, a lot in spectroscopy and in atoms and ions. And the, and the idea there is we can find some other transition in, in this case, mercury. And uh, the idea is that suppose if this is our clock transition, I, I slipped in some atomic notation for, for you here, but don't worry about that. We can still label this level one and level two, but the, but the idea then is suppose we, we irradiate this clock transition and let's suppose our, 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 our radiation for that transition is, is, is not resonant with a the frequency. Then when we, we start, if we start the atoms in the ground state, then uh, when we try this transition, if the atom doesn't absorb this radiation, then if we turn on this, this uh, transition here, we can scatter a light at a very high level. And in fact, the lifetime of the supper level in uh, Mercury is about two nanoseconds. And so we, we can actually scan, scatter 100 million photons a second. And we don't have to, we, all we needed is to actually capture a relatively small fraction of those. But with, when we do that, so the difference is, that, of course, if the atom is on resonance, then when we, when we turn on this detection laser, the atom is up here in this level, so there's no scattered radiation. So we can easily tell when the atom has absorbed the irradiation. And this, this little demonstration on, on shown in the graph below is that uh, when the, it, it, we, whoops, when we, we would, <coughs> pardon me. So we, we, we basically just left on both lasers at the same time. And the atom, when, uh, uh, when this laser was tuned properly, it would jump back and forth from this, this level here to this level here. And that's what you're seeing in there with these, these these steps in the fluorescence. And so what's nice about this, so if we just have a simple discriminator that tells us when, when the atom is in fluorescing strongly versus when it's, when it's in the ground state, not scattering, you see a little bit, that's just from stray light in the experiment. But the, in any case, we can have a discriminator set about halfway up, up the scale here. And we can tell essentially with 100% efficiency with when the atom absorbs the, the uh, the the, the radiate the clock radiation. Sorry about this. Um, oh, the, and of course, you know, we can actually, in principle, we could see uh, these a single atom. Uh, of course, we can't see it with our eyes because our eyes aren't sensitive to to this very short uh, ultraviolet wavelength. But what we can do instead is we can uh, we uh, sorry we can we can actually we 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 basically. Uh, bought a, uh, a, a video, a simple video camera that might be much less sophisticated than the ones you have in your phones and so on. But it allows us, it was sensitive to the ultraviolet light. So we can make pictures of the, of a single mercury ion. And a couple of interesting, first of all, uh, having trouble with my mouse here. You can, you, you know, the first thing you see is that, you know, there's some scattered light off, some straight scattered light off of the electrodes. Uh, and yet we can still, we can see this bright dot in the middle is actually the, the scattering from our tr single trap mercury ion. And another thing interesting about this picture is that the size of the atom here uh, is actually about 500 times, the diameter is about 500 times smaller, the diameter of the wave function, I should say, 
It's about 500 times smaller than the dot you see on the in the picture. And the, and the, the so the, the resolution in the picture is just limited by the limited optics we had. But uh, we have other ways to tell what the size of the atom is, its wave packet size is. And so that's why we can kind of make that statement. The other thing to say is that uh, there are atoms, so, certain ions that uh, and atoms that <coughs> fluoresce in the visible, visible part of the spectrum. For ions, it turns out barium it makes a good clock. Um, and you can, and the, the, the radiation that it emits on this corresponding transition here is in the blue. And you can actually see a single atom with your eye. Um, so anyway, there some other features is I, I was mentioning the time dilation effect of the movement lines. And, and, and as an interesting effect that's used in a lot of uh, uh, atomic physics experiments now. It's, it's called laser cooling. And there's a simple form, it's called Doppler cooling. And the idea, I'll just say, if I had more time, it would be, it'd become clear. But the idea, let's suppose we, let's suppose we have this laser on its tuned uh, closely to its transition, to, but below the trend where it wants to absorb max flowing. And what happens if the, if the atom is moving against the laser beam, uh, then it can, uh, the Doppler shift between the atom and the and the and the source, uh, the laser source, it'll it'll be shifted up. It basically the atoms see the laser shifted up in frequency because of the first order Doppler effect. Of course, when the atom is moving away from the laser, then it's shifted farther out of resonance, so it doesn't scatter very much. And the idea is there's this there's this big difference whether it's approaching the atom or not. And the, of course, the key thing we know when we scatter. Light, we, we scatter photons, and each if those each of those photons carries momentum, and that momentum, because of the say symmetry and the scattering, whether it's moving one way or the other, that which, which gives a damping force, so it cools the, the the atoms down. And uh, so, just to give you an idea how, how well that works, so the, the first experiments we did were at room temperature, and so the the, the mercury ion would start out roughly at the temperature of the room, about three hundred Kelvin. But anyway, with this ra this radiation pressure cooling, we could almost cool six orders of magnitude. We could cool down to a millikelvin. So this this basically all then suppress the time dilation shift also by this near nearly uh, six orders of magnitude. And it turns out we can even these days we can do even better with laser cooling. Different ver versions of laser cooling. We can now actually completely freeze the that almost completely freeze the atom out. And so you can think of a quantized harmonic oscillator and we can put it so it's with high probability in the ground state of its motion. So there wouldn't be any, dop any time dilation shift in that case, but there's always some residual motion. So, but anyway, we can, we can uh, suppress this time dilation shift by a huge amount. So this was a picture of, of the, our group. So that th these laser cooling experiments, I actually worked with my colleague, Bob Drollinger and we started that in, uh, in, in well, 1977. And anyway, then we joined up with Jim Burke was the guy who did develop the mercury clock and, and Wayne Otano, who was our resident expert theorist and uh, to keep us straight. And so uh, anyway, this, is a, this was not very long. It was one, about a year after, taken a year after we did the laser cooling and started the first clock experiments on mercury. So I'm not gonna go through all the steps uh, that we went through for the next 20 <laughs> years or so. Uh, and, but basically the features that we're playing on here is that the trapping, uh, even without the cooling, the average velocity of the atom uh, goes to zero. So the, the first order Doppler shift actually averages out. And the laser cooling then gives us this very small time dilation shift. Uh, and uh, and in these experiments, we, we we graduated. We went to uh, a, a, a trap uh, system that was operated at liquid helium temperature. And the main the two reasons for that is uh, it would at four Kelvin almost if you have a vacuum system at four, uh, at four Kelvin, almost everything will freeze out all the background gas except for helium. And helium, it turns out, is not doesn't cause, cause much perturbation to the the clock uh, transition. Uh, so we, uh, anyway, the idea is very small perturbations. There's some, the collisions almost disappear. What's interesting though is we have this app, this apparatus was run 
it, you know, in, in the lab. And so there was, there was uh, thermal radiation in the lab. Uh, and in fact, what, you know, it, what's, what, what always struck me was when, when I worked out in the electric field from thermal radiation, just the so-called black body radiation, the, the electric field is about 10 volts per centimeter in, in, at, at room temperature. And so it turns out that these electric fields cause a shift in the, in the, in the transition frequency. We have to count for that. So anyway, we, you know, we later went to low temperature because of that. Um, so anyway, what was nice about this covers between the first picture I showed you and, and this in 2006, about almost over 20 years. And anyway, the, the, this, this experiment that, that my colleague Jim Berkowitz headed up, uh, it was is basically the first clock with a systematic uncertainty that is uncertainty due to all these things like Doppler shifts and so on, that was less than the current cesium value. So this, you know, in a way, this I, I don't want to say we started the wave, but but basically all the, you know, the, the standards that I'm trying to make precise standards were shifted to pretty much to optical transitions. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to say a little bit more about frequency shifts. And there, there's some more mundane things we have to worry about, and that is that in, almost in any apparatus, there's ambient electric fields. That, you know, the metal surfaces can have oxide on them, and it gives uh, electric fields which can shift the frequency of the atom. And we always have to worry about magnetic fields. It turns out with the magnetic fields, we can easily measure other transitions in, in say the mercury or any of our clocks that are more sensitive to magnetic field. And so then we can, that way we can calibrate the magnetic fields and then actually calculate the shift of the clock transition frequency. So there's a, other interesting effects. I've already talked a little bit about relativity. And, and so the, the, this time dilation shift due to motion I've talked about, but there's another effect due to Einstein. So in, in his, in his after he realized his theory of general relativity, what he also told us was that, uh, that, that, that the time runs at different rates in different gravitational potentials. And again, it's not that, you know, it's not that the clock slow down, slows down for some reason due to, due to a, you know, a gravitational potential. It's, it's actually time that slows down. So we have to, we have to account for that effect. And uh, so I'll just give you an idea that, that on the surface of the Earth, the, uh, this, this 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 frequency shift is almost a part in ten to the nine, so way, you know, quite a bit larger than the than the shifts we you know we that we or the, the accuracy we want to claim. Uh, and in fact, this is a this is a problem when we compare clocks that that uh, we have to worry about the changes of uh, of the transition frequencies versus height. And so this is just a simple expression that. For a given change in height of, uh, uh, you know, the frequency changes by this expression here, where g is the local value of gravity, and, and c is the speed of light. And um, so, and, and actually, when when Chris said we call it a redshift because you know the astronomers have been when they you know been looking for quasars and things like that for many years now, and they 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 coined the term redshift because what what it meant was that that light was emitted from these distant objects, it was, the, the, those were the stars and galaxies were moving away from us. And that shifts the frequency down of the radiation we observe around those, uh, around those uh, objects. So that's why it's called a red shift. Uh, anyway, so uh, it, with this simple expression, we can calculate the, 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 you know, the changes of the clocks versus changes in height. And so just to give you an idea, it's, it's a small effect. And just to say how small the effect is, you, we can figure out what it means for, you know, on a human scale. So a little story here is, suppose you and a twin sibling were uh, separated at birth and you live, at, you live at sea level and your twin lives at Boulder, Colorado, about one and a half kilometers above sea level. It turns out after 80 years, your, your twin will only be about a millisecond older than you to this effect. So if, so it's an extremely small effect on a human scale, but it's an effect we have to worry about with clocks. And so I'm gonna show you a different clock here. Uh, it doesn't look much like a clock, of course. What you see on this optical table, this, this, this shiny tube here is actually uh, holds the ion trap and some other stuff. 
Uh, and all the other stuff you see around the table here is mostly uh, lenses and, and so on uh, for, for, for manipulating the laser beams. And of course, some black, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some electronics to, to drive the electric fields that holds the ion in the trap. Anyway, so, and, and this, this later experiment um, was quite a bit after the first Mercury experiment. And anyway, we shifted to aluminum clock and it has about the same wavelength as the Mercury. But one nice thing it has is that I mentioned that, they, that in Mercury, the upper state lifetime, which limits the resolution on, the, uh, on how we can do with the laser transition. In aluminum, it was about 20 seconds, 200 times larger than, uh, than a mercury. And so that means the precision of the, of the line and the width of the line we measure is that much more narrow. So we get much better discrimination. So that was one of the reasons we went to aluminum. It has some other features. Anyway, these are the two guys here that <coughs> from, have been working on this for the last 15 years or so. And uh, so anyway, for, as a fun demonstration of this, of this gravitational redshift, we, uh, this, uh, the clock in this room we called clock one. And it turned out we had an, another nearly as, you know, as identical as we could make in another clock in the room off to the right side in this, the adjacent room off to the right side in this figure. And, and so if we had the two clocks, the setups being exactly the same, we measured the frequency ratio of the two clocks and it was good to, in this, we didn't average very long. So, you know, we can do better if we, if we average the signals longer. But uh, anyway, it was good to, the, the frequency of the same to a little bit better than a part in 10 to 17. And so what we did, in the, and you'll see here is that uh, one of the guys working on the experiment, James Chow, you can see what he's done in this, in this, in the, put, he's put some jacks underneath his table. And so what he's doing is raising it up and he raises it up about 33 centimeters, a little over a foot. And we could see the frequency change due to the fact that this table was now real. So, so when we raise the clocks, they run at, they're in a slightly weaker gravitational potential and uh, they run slower. And so this is why we could, we could uh, you know, what caused the, the frequency ratio to be different than one. Okay, let me just say a little bit now. So the, the comic clocks, I, I, there's a number of interesting experiments with neutral atoms as well. And the, everything I said about the techniques are very much the same for neutral atoms. The one thing that is different is how they trap the atoms. And as I mentioned, we grab onto the charge, you might say, and they, they use a different technique where you, it turns out that if you use, uh, you know, uh, laser beams that have a strong intensity gradient, they can feel a force from this from this intensity gradient, it's called the Stark shift. And then, anyway, they can make these into patterns. This one, kind of a two-dimensional version of their trap, is like like an egg, you know, egg crate that holds eggs. And each, anyway, they 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 have their experiments to hold individual atoms in 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 one place. And and I, and I and I and there's so much I could say here, but you know, in this short time, I, what I really do want to just say is that the, the performance of the optic uh, both. The neutral and, uh, and ion optic clocks are about the same. And this, this reference here is a, a little out of date now. The, the experiments have been updated since this paper was written. But if you're interested, this is a good place to start because it talks about all the different techniques and you might start with that one. So what about the future? And of course, now we're, we, you know, the, the precisions we can get with these, many of these optic clocks is much better than cesium. So, uh, you know, <laughs> So should we redefine the second? And, and it, 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 you know, it, it brings about a, the problem is we we don't know what the best optical clock is. So, you know, you don't want to change the definition of the second, and then a year later, a better optic, optical clock is comes along, and, and you'd like some consistency. So right now, the, the the definition of the second is still based on the cesium transition at around nine gigahertz. And uh, so anyway, you know, this would be decided by. Uh, uh, scientific politicians <laughs> figure out what the definition should be. It'll probably change eventually, but as I say right now, it'd probably be premature to change the definition since we don't know which is the best optical clock. Uh, so, and there's some other things we can think about in the future. And this, this is another whole topic of, of, a, <coughs> of interest. Is, it's called the entanglement. And uh, Einstein, uh, you know, he was one of the people, I think it was actually, it was maybe. I can't remember whether it was Heisenberg, one of the one of the early pioneers in quantum physics, 
talked about entanglement. I, it, certainly, and in, in, in Einstein knew this, used this term entanglement. And basically, I, I can't really, it takes, it takes a whole lecture to tell you what I'm talking about here. But basically, if you combine uh, atoms or ions into certain uh, entangled states, it turns out you can measure much more precisely the, the transition frequency. And uh, I'll, I'll have to leave it at that. I won't be able to tell you why, but anyway, that, that's the, it, this this um, this effect of using entangled states. We've demo, we've we in other labs have demonstrated the effects, but so far it hasn't been included into a, an accurate clock. And, but that's coming, I think. Anyway, so what, what you know, I'm talking about? I started out talking about navigation, and of course, with these very precise clocks, now we can think about navigating down to the centimeter scale. And one one reason that might be interesting is that, for example. Uh, you know, precursors of, of uh, earthquakes are earth strains. You know, the, at two different positions, the, you know, the earth are at two different locations separated by, say, a kilometer, the, the relative heights of the, of the land is moving. And, and that's the strain that is, it can be a precursor for these earthquakes. And so basically we can, you know, if we can measure down to a centimeter reliably out in the field, this, this I think would, could become very useful. So a lot of people are thinking about that. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I, you know, there's just mapping the gravitational potential around the surface of the, of the Earth, so-called geodesy. Um, and there's many reasons, as physicists we're always think, trying to think of, uh, you know, new effects. And with these, with these, uh, you know, these, these high precisions, uh, we, you know, we think about various ways that the, the frequencies, the, the, the Pardon me. The strength of the relative forces of nature could change in time, and so we, you know, we and other labs have measured, say, compared our clocks. We, in fact, one experiment is compared our cesium clock to the mercury clock, and then measured over a long time, and we could set a limit on how much these the strengths of the forces were changing in time. So, and there's many different possibilities for that, and also there's ways now people are we we as a group we thought of ways to detect gravity waves that, using atomic transitions. And uh, so, and of course, you know, a sport with physicists ever since Einstein was to find out something wrong with Einstein's theory of relativity. And so far, he's doing just fine. We haven't found it anything, but maybe if we did find a difference, then it would show some of these new effects of nature. So, um, and I'm just going to conclude by saying, of course, I showed you, I showed you the group in 1976, and. By by 2018, we've grown we've grown a lot a lot, and in fact, we've gotten to 30 people at certain times in the in the in the early uh, 2000s. And but anyway, these are these are the real people, you know, working on the experiment. So it was, it was a big big operation. We had several different clocks, and also one of the things I, I haven't talked about is that in the mid 90s, we got involved with quantum computers, and it turns out that the, our, the ions we use for atomic clocks are also very good as quantum bits. So I, but I can't say anything about that. Anyway, all I wanted to say here is that a lot of good people, you know, working a long time were, were required to, to achieve these numbers. And I also want to thank our, our leadership at NIST. Was, it was just great as far as I was concerned. They, they basically, they didn't, they didn't make decisions for us. They let us do you know, what we wanted. We could determine what, which road we were taking. And, you know, they had to give approval, but they, they never said no, you know, so we could, we could determine our own course, which is a great thing to have. And also, I should say, oops, that we, uh, although, we, you know, we're funded by NIST, we also had uh, other eight government agencies that, uh, that were helping us fund these experiments. So just for luck, so, uh, am I, just am I running? Do I have a couple more minutes? I, is that okay? Can I take a couple more minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. So I, I mean, I, I'm doing this because I think some of the students find you know maybe somewhat interesting to see what it was like for me how I got into this business. And so and, and, and as a very young person, I, my parents had lived through the great what's called the Great Depression in the U.S. and that's when the economy was just was almost dead, and uh, but and they were lucky that they had a job. Just so, so many people didn't have jobs during this time that you know they, there was a big emphasis on me and my sister getting good grades and 
school so we could go to college and get a good job. Anyway, but and also my dad played, uh, you know, played simple mathematical games with me, which kind of interested, you know, got my interest in math going at that time. Uh, and I, I actually, you know, in spite of this emphasis of my parents on, you know, getting good grades, they, as long as I did that, I was free, to, <laughs> had a lot of freedom. So when I was a young kid, I, you know, I played with model airplanes a lot. I always liked mechanical things. And uh, so that's what I did at an early age. And then uh, when I got to be a teenager, my, my buddies and I, we were, we were all interested in cars and motorcycles. So, so in fact, I, I got my first car at age 14. I couldn't drive it because you couldn't get a license to drive it until I was 16. But anyway, my, I, I bought it and my dad brought it home. And then I spent the, about the next year and a half, you know, tearing that car down and fixing it up and uh, putting it back together. So, I mean, I actually learned, you know, it was a good experience to learn all these mechanical things, doing something like that. Uh, and just a little bit about my education. So after high school, <clears throat> pardon me, I went to the University of California and I started out uh, in the, at the Davis campus, which is near to Sacramento, California, where, where I grew up. And uh, so anyway, just, I didn't really think about what they went there. But, I, you know, after the first years, it was, it was clear, well, even before then, that, I mean, Berkeley was the place, that was the hot place for physics, the Berkeley campus. And so in my junior year, it was, it was totally easy to do. I just had to fill out a form and I could enroll down in, in, in physics down in, in Berkeley. And so that's where I got my undergraduate degree. And then I went to, to, to graduate school. I mentioned working for, Hans, uh, for, for Norman Ramsey. And then I did my postdoc at University of Washington, actually working with Hans Daniel, the guy, one of the guys who uh, shared the invention of the, of the tramps. And that's about it. <laughs> so thanks for listening. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Thanks. Thank you, Professor, for that insightful lecture. Your masterful explanation of these complex topics has ensured that viewers would have taken away a lot from this lecture. The way you went about explaining the concepts of atomic clocks and explaining the need of atomic clocks has been extremely insightful. And when this lecture, when mixed with your personal anecdotes, have and the way you made these complex topics, you explained them in an extremely simple way, is something that has ensured that the audience has taken away a lot from this lecture and is inspired from it. Your personal story well, too you. is very touching, sir. And I we hope have it a... work. Sorry, yes. go ahead. Yes, sir, we have a few we have a few questions from the audience, Professor. Uh -huh. And atomic clocks today are used in a lot of domains like GPS and time signal radio transmitters. What are the current factors that limit precision of atomic clocks? And why do we need higher precision for such utilities? Well, I think and, and it's not so much the transition frequency, but we want higher accuracy. And the, the simple, you know, answer is, is navigation. You know, we still do navigation, maybe now to look for earth strains and things like that. But that's still one of the main applications. The other thing too is that uh, we, you know, in communications, you know, if, if if you know bits, you know stream, bit streams can be synchronized with very very high precision, then we can transfer a lot more information. And an eavesdropper, if he doesn't have a good clock, he can't he can't capture these signals. And so that's that's another application. So I, I would say, you know, it, it, we're never going to run out of out of uh, uh, you know reasons for doing it. And the other night, the other interesting thing is, you know, in terms of you know what limits the precision. The, there's actually no fundamental limit. If we could say use more atoms with more and more narrow uh, absorption features, we could, you know, we could increase the, the performance from what I've already described. So there's really in principle, no limit to how, how well we could do. Yes, indeed. And as you mentioned, so over the years, as you walked us through your lecture, there have been significant improvements in the precision of an atomic clock. So are there any limits to the precision? Like, are there any what? Sorry, I just didn't... Are there any limits to the precision of an atomic clock? I think, yeah, no, I guess I sort of was trying to, I was answering that one in the, at the end of uh, talking about the first question. And that, that, there's no fundamental limits. I mean, uh, uh, 
you know, we can find more and more narrow transitions. In fact, one that I didn't mention is that, that several groups there's a ha, have gotten interested in looking at not atomic transitions, but nuclear transitions. And uh, of course, we, we don't have lasers for, for, for gamma rays and things like that. But, but there, are, there are optical transitions in, in certain uh, uh, atoms that, uh, 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 sorry, optical nuclear transitions. An example that, uh, uh, of that that several labs are looking at is turns out thorium-229 has a narrow resonance uh, in the visible. It's about 150 nanometers transition uh, wavelength. Uh, but people are trying, and what's nice about this, this idea, just one of the nice things about it is it turns out the electron cloud around this thallium, uh, thallium atom, thorium atom, sorry, uh, would shield a lot of the environmental effects. So that's one, one reason people are excited about this. And it's just started. I mean, it, building a 150 nanometer laser and measuring is not, not so easy. <laughs> But anyway, I think you know there's several labs uh, doing that, so that may be one of the developments that, that comes before too long. Indeed. So, Professor, you have had a long and distinguished career in the field of quantum physics. Could you shed some light on your motivation to enter this field? And could you also briefly elaborate on your significant breakthroughs in this field, which led to you receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2012? Okay, sure. You see, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I think one one thing I, I I mentioned that my father used to play math games with me when I was little, and then I actually started as a math uh, major in college. But then I I was taking physics uh, classes, and that, that that really got me interested. But I think to, to answer that question, I mean, what I liked is you know I had this experience using my hands, cars, and things like that, uh, and I just you know I like the mechanical aspect, building these devices, and then. I also just like the, the the idea of high precision, you know, it just that really attracted, you know, to look for fault, small effects and things like that. So it was a, you know, it was an evolving process. And, but that's, uh, you know, I, by the time I, I got to graduate school, I, I clear I wanted to work on atomic clocks and, or, or atoms rather at least. And then uh, uh, some major uh, steps for me was, I think probably in, in my own mind, one of the, uh, you know, one of the, you know the highlights is that we we knew about this laser cooling before. You know, I, my actually my my thesis or my postdoc advisor, he and I wrote a, a, a real short paper on this idea of, of the laser cooling. And uh, so anyway, we, when I went I went to NIST not very long after we had written this little paper, and uh, my boss at that time was forward thinking, and he said, "Let's do this," you know. So. He was able to get us the money to uh, to try this laser cooling, and in fact, we uh, you know we had an empty lab, and then six months later, we, we were able to to show show this cooling effect. So that was, I think, one of that was the, certainly one of the highlights of my of my career. And you know, there's been a lot of other uh, interesting things along the way. I, one of our other achievements, again, working in a group, is that. Uh, I think we, you know, this idea of quantum computing. I think we were we were the first ones to to take individual quantum systems to make uh, to make uh, quantum bits, and we could we could perform gates on these individual quantum systems. So that was a, another highlight, I would say. But you know, there's just there's so many steps along the way that you know you. I think there, you know, there's many rewards, I would say, along the way. So. Indeed, Professor, your life and career has truly been very inspiring. And in 2005, you played a pivotal role in building the most precise atomic clock using quantum logic. And in your lecture towards the end, you mentioned in the future that entangling atomic clocks would probably lead to greater precision. And something similar was done in 2020, where MIT scientists proposed a design for an atomic clock that used entangled atoms for greater yeah. precision. So with the yeah. precision of clocks improving by the year, where do you believe the future of atomic clocks lie? <laughs> I know mean, that, that's what I say. There's no fundamental limit, and yeah, I didn't. Fortunately, uh, this this idea of entanglement, and squeezing, we call it spin squeezing, is it takes a, another long lecture. But the, uh, but anyway, yeah. So so uh, you know, we I would say we at other labs have done demonstrations of this 
effect that MIT talked about. And, and, and you know, they're, they're aiming for a clock and, and, and an optical clock that uses this entanglement. And so are we, and so there's other labs too. So it'd be interesting to see, but it, it's, as I say, we can see, we can see the effects of the improvement, but not on real accurate clocks yet. But that's, as I say, I think that's coming. So in any way to answer your, your last question, I mean, again, I'll just say that in principle, there's no limit to how, how well we, you know, how precise we can get. Indeed. So your pie also, as you mentioned again in your lecture on how your research in developing atomic clocks has played a significant role in advancing quantum computing too. So what role do you envision quantum computers playing in the future? Also, our audience would love to know about the different quantum computing platforms. Yeah, well, I, that's that's an even longer than an hour lecture, these different platforms. But I mean, I think, you know, atoms are one possibility. Atoms are ions. So, I mean, we, you know, we and other labs just using atoms and we've de demonstrated all the, the primitives, that is the logic gates and things like that. And, you know, We'd like we need to scale up to larger numbers to make a, a useful quantum computer. Another strong contender for uh, a good platform for uh, quantum bits is uh, superconducting junctions, and they can, you know, again, it's a little bit of a story, but they can actually with the superconducting junctions, you can make what looks, at least in principle, looks like an atom, a two-level system, and they can use those systems to also make quantum bits, and so. I, you know, I, I think things are even more wide open with with uh, quantum computing versus clocks. That is, we we know there's probably a really finite number of clocks that might be good, but you know, I, I think we're not very close to deciding what the best, certainly what the best quantum computer could be. And and we're you know we're just in the infancy of, of that. And, but the reason the reason it's interesting is, I, I you know a little bit of the story is that that, that some of the you and the students may already know, but in in 1995, roughly, I think it was 1994, but a computer theorist named Peter Shore, he's now at MIT, he came up with an algorithm uh, that's, that basically said, if you could make this quantum computer, uh, you could efficiently factorize large numbers. And so that maybe sound like a little bit of a esoteric math problem, but I'm sure plenty, many of the people in the, in the audience probably know that most of the most of the encryption systems that are used these days, they derive their security from the inability to factorize large numbers, and uh, so this 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 scheme that Peter Shore laid out for making a quantum computer that would crack these codes. And you know, I think you know, it, I mean, it, that's a whole interesting topic by itself. So so you know, I mean, that's so that's one of the reasons the government jumped in on this is. Uh, in the mid '90s, was this idea of quantum computers, for, and largely the agencies I listed there, you know, intelligence agencies, you know, so they, they, uh, they you know, they, they had to be interested in this problem. And what, what what's evolved now, though, is I think it, uh, it you know, it so it that quantum computer that Peter Shor came up, it, it could be used if we could make a good enough quantum computer, could be used to, you know, still open up, you know, to to uh, decrypt data that probably the agencies have been taking for 20 years and, you know, they could get the secrets that way. But I think what's for the future, it, 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 it probably, and I get this from Peter Shore when I've talked to Peter Shore, he, he says now that the classical cryptographers are coming up with algorithms, uh, whereas he, at least as far as he knows, Peter Shore, uh, he doesn't know how a quantum computer could be used to, to break the code. So, you know, it may, it may not become a, a, a real issue in the long term, but there's all these other applications. And the one, the one thing I wanted to mention is that the one of the things you know we did some temple demonstrations with quantum computers, but uh, the, the you know the one application I think all physicists are looking for is that they they can solve lots of really hard problems in in physics and other areas. So for for example. And, and you know Richard Richard Feynman, famous uh, particle physicist, you know, is, is around 1980. He he was at some uh, 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 conference apparently on classical reversible computing. <laughs> apparently, the story goes he's he got up and said, "Well, I know the ideal system. It's 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 you know quantum systems because they're reversible, reversible." So anyway, that, there's a lot of 
a lot of, a lot of excitement and still this that, that excitement still exists of that and we just can't right now we can't you know as a field working on quantum computation we're not quite enough to do you know good enough to do anything any useful problem but i think that's the real hope for all of us is that you know that it can solve really hard, hard problems so richard feynman was interested in solving the dynamics of nucleons and things like that but there's other more uh, you know uh, maybe immediately useful things for the whole population and that's what people dream about is maybe <coughs> you could synthesize the you know or rather you know uh, simulate the action of say some complicated molecule that might be used in drug therapy you know for for good purposes and and, uh, and so maybe we could simplify you know using a quantum computer maybe we could simplify the action of those molecules without out actually having to make the real molecules in the lab. So, I mean, that's a bit far out, but that's the kind of thing we're thinking of. Yes, uh, quantum computing does promise an exciting future with great applications, both from an industrial and academic perspective. Finally, Dr. Weinland, is there any message you'd like to give to the aspiring physicists in the audience present and the student community of IIT Madras? I, I mean, I would say this, you know, I mean, for almost any discipline and I think you you know the you know the students you know the main thing is you want to choose something you like and you're going to have to work whatever it is to be successful you're going to have to work hard but I think I think you know you want it you, you don't want to be pushed in a certain direction for example occasionally I guess well you know did you think about winning the Nobel Prize and if you if you go into a career thinking about winning prizes you won't get very far it's just the chances are so small so you don't want that motivation and in fact what i think mo mo motivates me and all of my mo certainly most of my colleagues is just that the work is just really interesting you know by itself so that's i would say the real the real reward is that just working on these interesting systems so so again just the message to student would be just you know find something you like and you're, you know, to be successful, you have to work hard. And even if you change your mind uh, that, that, you know, don't, you know, that's okay. You don't want to do it every weekend, week, <laughs> change your mind on what you're going to work about, but you certainly can you change your mind. And, and in fact, you know, we all take kind of detours in our, in our paths in life. So, so don't get discouraged if you find something more interesting, as long as you work hard for it, you'll, you'll be fine. Thank you, Dr. Weinlin, for that inspiring message. The theme of the message on pa pursuing passion rather than awards and about having the will to choose what you want is truly inspiring. And I'm sure that the audience present here would have learned a lot. We thank the audience for attending the session. Please fill the feedback form shared in the YouTube chat, which will help us improve the upcoming sessions. Up next, we have Olympic gold medalist, Ms. Carolina Marin and our coach, Dr. Fernando Rivas at 4.30 p.m and Dr. Shashi Tharoor at 6 p.m. Stay tuned to I Shastra IIT Madras' YouTube channel for more such inspiring and engaging sessions. Thank you. Thank you. And again, good luck to all the students in the audience and with their careers. So, all right. Thank you.